All right, so good afternoon, and we do have guest speakers. We've been sort of going back and forth about this. Um, I think when we have too many options, then it's, it's harder to sort of you know, prune it down. So we were actually debating in the class about a guest speaker coming here or coming through the Google Hangout. Um, and so finally, I think we were going to do this on Hangout until yesterday. But then you wrote to me at about 2 in the morning or something. Yeah, <laughs> so he said, oh, at 2.30 or something in the morning, he says, oh, we'll be able to come. <laughs> so, no hangout, you know, you get actual guest speakers. So, um, uh, they're going to be talking about Mesh. I've known Matt since, uh, for about a year now. We met uh, at this uh, public library of science, uh, which is down by Embarcadero. I was there for a talk and um, actually ran into one of our students there, Louis Murillo, who's been, he graduated a few years ago. Uh, he was in this course and he was in the open source class and then uh, he graduated and you know, I hear from him uh, periodically and he was actually there and so that's how we got to talking. And then I found out that these guys work with a group called the Sula Room uh, in Oakland and they're building mesh networks. Right? So one thing leads to the other. And then uh, we've talked on Twitter about um, a project they have, uh, it's called Open Garden, right? Mm -hmm. um, open Garden and so lots of small little dots and you know, just like the mesh, you sort of connect them and it turns on. So, uh, so they'll t tell us about what they've been doing. They've, I think they've got something to show here as well. Um, and we've talked about the mesh a little bit in the OLPC context, so hopefully you'll be able to relate to some of that. Um, and then once this is done, we'll put it up on the, on the web. So I'll leave it to you folks to introduce and uh, tell us more about this. Thanks a lot. So, do you want to describe what a mesh network is? Sure, I can start. Well, first let's kick it off with, um, my name is Matt, I'm Matt Sennett, and uh, we're here, yeah, we're members of the Pseudo Room at Hackerspace in Oakland. We're with a project called Pseudo Mesh, that's sort of like our organization. They're both now uh, not state nonprofits. And uh, we're launching a project called the People's Open Network, or People's Open Network. Check these out while we chat uh, or afterwards. Uh, the People's Open Network is, as we said, a mesh network. Uh, that right now it's decentralized. Anyone can participate, anyone can start building part of this mesh network, and we're building a part of it and going to see how far we can take it. Uh, and uh, the separation of those of those projects is also in abiding by the decentralized principles of mesh networks and the philosophy around that, a way of enabling other groups to create their own organizations and plug into the network in their own ways. So um, one of our emphases is uh, to encourage um, community groups and neighborhoods to um, take on networking uh, projects so to maintain their own networks. And uh, yeah, a mesh uh, network is essentially um, what the internet was designed to be, um, in which uh, uh, the, the, the nodes themselves are decentralized and each node can talk to any other node. If a single node in the network goes down, then it routes around uh, the damage and uh, continues to stay connected. Um, so uh, since the... Um, over the past couple of decades, we've seen the emergence of these uh, more centralized internet service providers and uh, a, a kind of consolidation of power and control of networks in Comcast, AT&T, etc. Um, so this is uh, an attempt to work with internet service providers that do allow sharing of connectivity in their terms of service um, to make more efficient use of available bandwidth. That's so why we've got this goofy uh, clip art style image here, which I think is kind of a kitschy and fun. Uh, but yeah, that's the idea is that all these individual intersections, all these points, right, are actual individual nodes in the network that are able to communicate to each other. So the, the nice part about this, the, the things you get from the mesh network is a local network as well as a more res resilient network. So if any of these nodes nearby you is connected to the internet and your connection's down, you can still route traffic and get to the internet, right, through those other nodes. But alternatively, say all the internet connections are down in the event of a disaster, these other network, these other nodes can be able to network locally and start to pass data and traffic and run services and things like that very easily. So that's sort of the resiliency factor. And we'll go more into detail in a second. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess we've already touched on yeah. all the reasons why mesh networks are bad. The centralized nature, the resiliency, and um, that it's a community-owned project. And that's not necessarily true of mesh networks. There's um, most uh, successful implementations of mesh networks thus far have been in uh, municipal, citywide networks and in the military. Um, but uh, there's a strong movement and a trend towards uh, community-owned networks, and those are not necessarily mesh networks either, 
Um, but uh, one of the ethos that we're kind of attempting to strengthen here is um, towards uh, gesturing towards the commons and bringing uh, ownership of our communications networks back into the hands of communities themselves. And this, this idea, actually, we're borrowing, there's a global network of folks who are making these networks in different areas in the world, and uh, one group that we're especially tied to, given one of our members, the overlap and the things we learned from them, uh, is in Slovenia, to the Slovenia network called VLAN Slovenia. Uh, it's huge, and this, this emphasis on being community-run, community-owned and operated is essential, essential, or was essential for them to grow, and is essential for us to grow as well. Yeah, here's an action shot. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, right now we only have two experimental nodes. Um, this is uh, one of the houses that I live in. Um, we're putting a node up on the rooftop. Um, and they don't necessarily have to be on rooftops, although that's encouraged, uh, better coverage if they're on rooftops. They can also be mounted outside of houses. So thinking up uh, interesting ways that people could, you know, nestle their nodes in flower boxes or uh, bird feeders or that sort of thing. Um, they were interesting creative ideas. Yeah. You can see that that's Pico Station right there is the same device with a very long antenna that these are just interoperable way that's going right off. That's actually a bullet. Oh, is it a bullet? We do, oh. <laughs> yeah, we do not recommend. Uh, it's, it, it, that only has uh, like four megabytes of flash memory, so uh -huh. we're seeking routers that have the, at least eight um, to be able to run uh, the firmware plus any other um, local applications uh, that we design um, or that other people design. Um, so uh, currently, actually this is a slightly dated presentation, so we've, we've been uh, finishing up the software uh, as of this past week, actually, so we're about ready to launch our initial test deployment, um, and uh, uh, the, the bigger challenge right now is, is actually in getting the word out and building a community base around the network. How does it work? Do you want to explain how it works? Sure. Why not? So uh, the thing for us that's really excellent that we've also picked up from these other networks and learning from this global community of folks who are developing software and using hardware is that we can use off-the-shelf material. We can use off-the-shelf routers like these Pico stations, for instance. Uh, there's been recent development in these really uh, inexpensive devices that will see, suit most of our needs. Uh, and so it's, it's easy to get these on hand. It's a huge advantage. It was previously a big barrier uh, to launching mesh networks. Um, the, one we're, the other component of this is that there has been an investment in open source software for networking generally. If folks are familiar with networking, you might have run OpenWRT. We're using that same firmware and we're customizing it given all these community packages that have been developed and maintained by the OpenWRT community. So we're wrapping that up and adding new features and adding new packages to make it work for our network, but um, it's, it's really based on the open source development so far. Um, we're using a protocol for actually doing the routing. You might imagine, so say, like I was saying before, right, I'm at one connection, one node, and uh, I can't exactly reach the internet for my connection, where do I go next? So the algorithm, the protocol to actually figure out which node do I go to next to find the internet and do that efficiently is sort of a little tough problem, although it's very small, like very, very small and elegant. And so we're working with this protocol called Batman Advance, which has been developed and improved upon uh, by these German hackers. Um, there's lots of good documentation on it, so that's the route we're going, but there are other ones, there are other effective ones, and ones that have operated at scale, too. So there's, there's some options, and this one's the one we're getting behind because we actually think it's going to be developing further in the future, and we can contribute to the development of that protocol. Um, let's see here. And the other um, one that's most commonly used is OLSR. Um, Commotion Project is using that. So Commotion is a project by the uh, Open Technology Institute, and they've been doing some uh, mesh network deployments in uh, New York and D.C. and Detroit. Also a good project. So the, the other side of this, besides just getting the infrastructure stuff, the hardware, the software, and a good, a good protocol that's going to scale, um, is actually working in the community. That, that's why the emphasis of our project so much is making a community-built network. And so we, we need to find maintainers for nodes and people who have infrastructure, like buildings, either the cities or homes, like individuals, that we can actually put, they can put up routers and maintain them, or we can be in communication and contact and, uh, and make sure there's a good support network for running this network. Um, yeah, and then finally, uh, there's two flows by which we're able to connect this local network to the wider internet, uh, which is from individual connections such as like your home router. Say your ISP allows you to share your connection, uh, then you can actually just share that with everyone on the network. So anyone who's nearby, you might be able to route. 
traffic through your internet connection, your, your modem that you have in your house. Um, but additionally, anyone who has really big connections, especially ISPs or middle persons or labs or nonprofits at the Internet Archive, they can, they can give us a connection to their really fat pipelines. Uh, and then we can connect that to everybody else on the network near them. So that's sort of, that's the other side of this, is also weighing in different bigger parties and making sure they're connected all the, all the way down um, to the mesh network. And of course, the, the first question that comes to mind when people hear that is, um, but uh, uh, what if I don't want to donate all of my bandwidth to someone BitTorrenting down the street? Um, so uh, in that case, we're, we're designing um, a method by which people can donate a portion, a percentage of their bandwidth, um, and it could also prioritize their traffic when they're using their connection. Yeah. So you can talk about so change it as you need to. Um, network topology, well, actually, there's a more extended one further down. Shall yeah, we can go back. Let's get this one for now. This is a sure. full diagram. Yeah. So... Oh, you, you want to we can skip it and go to the next one. Mm -hmm. um, so, as Jenny uh, touched on, there's just a few different types of uh, those that we're working with. Um, but just simply the ones that would be established outside, outdoors, that are outdoor ready, and the ones that would be indoor. Um, in order to run the, next, the connections, like the, just a basic mesh network, like maybe between a few houses, you really can do it with like an indoor router, or you can do it with an outdoor router that aren't too high powered, and they're operating on the 2.4 gigahertz band. But in terms of actually establishing a very large network where there's lots of connections, we need some more stabilizing backbone. We need a, a really solid connection in the, in the background that, folks can get to quickly, so within a couple hops, so like maybe three hops to get to, to make sure that your traffic is driving very efficiently. So that's why there's an emphasis around like having these big sort of maybe building top uh, nodes that would establish a really high speed connection that could be point to point on the, and use the five gigahertz band. And uh, for the indoor routers to essentially spread the signal throughout a building, um, we're recommending, there's a really low cost router, it's like $22, I believe, on, online, called a TP-Link um, that we recommend for indoor routers. And then these uh, outdoor 2.4 gigahertz that are the Pico stations and, and uh, the 5 gigahertz ones that we're using currently are um, nano station and nano station and vibes. So this is all ubiquity gear. Um, generally, I think those uh, run around $70 uh, new. But um, we obtain them by way of crowdfunding, yeah. which I think there's a slide. Yeah, there's a slide. <laughs> internet. How does it get internet? So here's the full, yeah, full flesh. I just saw this image at the bottom before. So these are individual connections, like folks at their homes or offices or, or what have you. Um, they're able to mesh together sometimes. Maybe they might not be connected yet. So maybe eventually there will be multiple connection points. And these are devices down here, so people's smartphones and laptops. And so these are uh, relay nodes, this is sort of like the backbone that we were mentioning before, that traffic can pass through for the mesh. Uh, and then finally at the top, you can see we're, we'll be running um, exit nodes so that all the traffic will be uh, exposed um, through, through the exit nodes uh, to the global internet. So it's um, coming out of VPN. Um, another major concern that people always bring up is uh, what if someone's downloading child porn connected to the mesh or, um, or pirating what have you. Um, am I responsible for that person's traffic? Much? And the way that we're dealing with that is by running the traffic through a, a VPN. So uh, the IP address of the network is uh, would be in Texas. And uh, the nonprofit organization that we've created, Pseudomesh, would be handling any DMCA requests and takedown requests. So it's a legal <laughs> effort. <laughs> Hardware. Again, um, so the uh, oh, you passed around the uh, Pico station. Yeah, you don't great. To look at it, it'll be coming your way. Um, all the ubiquity gear, gear uses Atheris chipsets, which is um, one of our blocks in being a totally open project. That uh, Atheris chips are not open; uh, it's proprietary, closed hardware. Um, so that's you know sort of a compromise that we have to make as open hardware is still an emerging. Uh, phenomenon, uh, but we do generally stand behind the open hardware. Uh, cheap home routers, uh, 
people can also uh, use their existing routers or old routers and um, we can assess whether it's OpenWRT compatible. There's actually a, a list on the OpenWRT wiki of compatible routers, so if you want to check and see if a router you have lying around at home uh, could run OpenWRT, uh, just search for the name of that router in OpenWRT and you'll find a wiki page on it most likely. Um, and uh, we also have some openmesh.com routers. OpenMesh is a project uh, in Portland that they've created their, their own hardware um, and they're supporting mesh network projects. And actually, uh, the network in Oakland, there was a mesh network in 2009 to 2011 that was based on open mesh uh, hardware and uh, firmware. They kind of, they run a um, sort of a cloud service by which uh, nodes are configured. Um, so they'll see where the location of the, the router is and uh, detect which network it is and has already set up uh, sort of the software tool set to maintain the network. Software. So yeah, when you um, successfully flash a router with OpenWRT and log into it, um, it provides you with a, a, I haven't tried this, but it looks somewhat delicious. <laughs> yes, it is. Attitude adjustment. Um, and uh, yeah, as Matt was saying earlier, it's an um, uh, open source community pretty strong community. Um, most mesh networks in the world have been working with OpenWRT. Um, and this is the, the Batman crew from Germany. <laughs> Batman stands for Better Approach to Mobile Ad Hoc Networking. And there's a bunch of toolkits. I believe there's a, a package called Tool Belt. Batman Tool Belt. <laughs> 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 Sure. And so we touch on this briefly, I'll, I'll go over it one more time just to make sure it's clear because it's kind of confusing. So Jenny and I are members of and co-founders of the Pseudo Room, this hackerspace in Oakland. Uh, and through that, there's sort of a convergence actually through a conference that we held. It was at the State of the Room or one of the unconferences. First, uh, our first annual unconference. Yeah, the State of the Room, <laughs> the State of the Pseudo Room. And uh, as a result of that, um, we, there was a, a coalescence of folks around making a mesh network and focusing on internet uh, projects. And recently, now we've also incorporated both of these entities uh, with the state, the state nonprofits. Um, that's Student Mesh, that's the group we work with. And we're launching and inviting others to become partners on People's Open Network. People's Open Network. And um, so, that as, as a nonprofit, um, uh, we're, we're uh, an open space um, operating out of Student Room, so anyone can come on a Thursday night and just hack with us. Three nights out of three Thursdays out of the month are just open hack nights and one Thursday is more of a general meeting for strategy and onboarding new people and that sort of thing. But uh, you can also just come by and play with uh, networking uh, gear. And um, we're also going to be hosting uh, classes and workshops to teach people how to maintain their own networks, uh, focus groups to uh, brainstorm on local services and applications that we can put on the mesh as well. And uh, working on sustainable business models. And I hope we have some time for feedback from you all at the end of this, also, if you have any ideas on uh, sustainable business models. And to give you some, uh, some info on that, too, you know, we're, um, some of the things we imagine that are possible, we know that, that we can possibly negotiate and work out, is that given that we're making this network decentralized to begin with, that if other players can start working on it, we can meet in the middle. So, even geographically, for instance. Like if Berkeley's developing, even a city sponsored sort of network, we can be in the middle and make a buffer and they'll both communicate and it will all work as long as they're just open, uh, open connections. So things like uh, sole proprietorships, existing ISPs, new ISPs, cities, nonprofits, other kinds of businesses, all those things can start launching and building a network, especially if they can see a value proposition or if there's some sort of service they can provide. So that's sort of the realm we're very interested in figuring out how we can work with other people and make it grow to know that it's like a coalition of folks supporting like a very wide network. And um, a peering agreement is sort of the terms by which uh, two networks agree to connect to each other, so the terms under which they're um, keeping their networks dedicated to being open, for instance, might be one of the principles of a peering agreement, um, so that anyone can join the, and participate in the network. Um, and uh, there's lots of examples already of, of peering agreements, um, actually, w VLAN uh, Slovenia, for instance, uh, 
has the first international mesh network connection with uh, Croatia, I believe. And so you know, they uh, connected to each other under a peering agreement. Um, you had to use radio waves through a mountain range to get to them. That is a pretty <laughs> <laughs> fantastic connection. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, the community, the larger mesh networking community, the larger international mesh networking community is also um, uh, working on a network commons license, uh, similar to a creative commons license, but uh, a set of principles under which uh, uh, free networks are established and connect to each other. So, we well, don't have anything with the crowdfunding. Oh, it's on here. I think it might be a little bit later. Okay, that's yeah, next. That's next. <laughs> so our, our current plan, to give you the, the full rundown, this is usually how we describe it to folks, you know, when we meet them just briefly, um, is that so we've launched People's Open Network, People's Open Net Net, and we're currently where those stars are at. We're deploying this test network. So we want to make sure that our network services are operating. We want to make sure that people can actually mesh and get internet uh, connections from any different node, et cetera, et cetera. And just to test quality of service and things like this, do, do traffic analysis, security, vulnerability assessments, or stuff like that. So we can patch, 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 and, and be ready to deploy in a larger context. And the next step, our plan is to find a particular neighborhood. We're looking at a couple of various uh, neighborhoods in Oakland to actually go through, go door knocking, do community building, talk to folks, and find folks to host some of these nodes, and basically provide an entire, have the community provide their own internet for an entire neighborhood and use that as a marketing tool to say this is what your neighborhood can look like if you all had free internet as accessible from anywhere and it was run by your community. And with that, we'll have a big fat button on our website that says, you know, join the mesh, join the network. You can buy a node, you can give us some money and maybe even buy one for someone who can't afford it and then we will give you a node, we'll flash it and deliver it to you and help you set it up and so we can have really early adopter widespread coverage, hopefully across all the city of Oakland and beyond if we can. Uh, and from there, start building out this backbone and start building out connections to other partners, major connections like Internet Archive, cities, labs, et cetera, et cetera. That's sort of the trajectory. Um, and uh, how we've initially bootstrapped the operation was actually a pretty minimal uh, effort crowdfunding campaign um, in July, I believe. And uh, it was just uh, set up on, on WePay as a campaign site and posted to a couple subreddits and tweeted and posted to Facebook, etc. And it was surprising, actually, um, how quickly we raised exactly what we needed. It was initially $2,200, uh, and then we raised it so that we would have a little extra funds to buy things like power cables and uh, antennas, replacement parts, enclosures. Um, for the routers, outdoor routers, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, lots of uh, support from people in Oakland and people outside of Oakland, uh, people I'd never heard of. Um, so this is also right around the time of the Snowden, Edward Snowden leaks. And I think uh, people, people's awareness and uh, concern over um, the security of, of uh, their, their internet uh, habits and uh, privacy factors uh, have made mesh networks more interesting. Um, yeah, how, many, how many networks, so we, we found uh, like 150 or so or something, or was it out of the routers? So. Oh, um, yeah, we were, we, we were able to purchase, uh, it was an eBay auction actually from someone who was upgrading their, their network equipment. Um, it was 120 nodes total, so about 77 of those Pico stations uh, that were being passed around, and um, 30 to 40 uh, of uh, the bullets and nanostations, and nanostation M5s, so the um, 5 gigahertz. And since then we've about doubled it by finding uh, a bunch of Iraqi routers at a hacker space in San Francisco, actually, at the Winch Bridge. Mm -hmm. So we've got quite a few routers on hand so we can start building in between connections and make sure people are connected and such. The Iraqi Sparkies. Which are not easy to flash with. So if people, yeah, people want to talk about the esoteric yeah, <laughs> process of flashing a yeah, Meraki router, we can talk about it. <laughs> well, this is also not an updated map. Um, I think this, this map only has about 20 to 25 uh, nodes on it, and that's doubled over the past couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually have a Pretty good blanket of potential nodes, and, and this is if you go to meshmap.suterum.org, anyone can uh, just click their location and add a, a couple of uh, details about like 
the name of their node, uh, email contact information, um, whether they have rooftop access or second floor access even. Um, and uh, when people say, I want to join the mesh, how do I start? You just point them to that website and they have added uh, their locations as potential nodes. Those are the first people we're going to uh, reach out to. There's already five in San Francisco, too, so if folks want to add themselves to the map and join a community of five other people already. <laughs> yeah. There's also a um, really exciting project uh, in the sense that there's so many uh, moving parts and, and different things to learn from. So learning about hardware, software, networking, operations. Um, all these things. This, this uh, picture is from uh, an experiment in which we were using DirecTV satellite dishes hooked up to USB Wi-Fi dongles and attempting to shoot a signal across Lake Merritt in Oakland. When we were able to make a connection, it was just sending the file at about mm, two kilobytes a second. So, <laughs> <laughs> not the strongest connection. And, and probably that had something to do with our proximity to the water. Um, you may know about the... Have you taught them about the Fresnel? Um, so, mm -hmm. No, I didn't. I'm pretty sure the water has something. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, the signal comes, it shoots out at, in kind of a football shape, so you have to watch your uh, bottom layer there and potential interference. Uh, water is the bank to mesh networks. <laughs> and that's me, and that's uh, my house. And we're mounting a router on top of the house. So we have two experimental nodes right now. Two houses. Of course, ultimately, we have a plan for global connectedness uh, to mesh the planet. <laughs> We'd like to work with anybody else on, on the planet who is also working on mesh networking, and we, and we already do. Actually, Jenny, you want to describe the conference event? Oh, yeah, uh, every, there's a couple of events that are um, significant in the, in the Community Wireless International Community. Um, Community Wireless Summit happens annually. This year it was in Berlin. Um, and there were folks from uh, it was hosted by Freifunk, which is one of the oldest mesh networks that's in Germany. Um, Freifunk and Funk Feuer is in uh, Vienna, are probably two of the oldest networks. Athens Mesh is, has also been around for a while. Um, folks from uh, Ninux in Italy, Milan, Slovenia, um, Altermundi in Argentina. Um, uh, there's uh, the Wireless for Communities project in uh, India, um, which has built about 10 uh, to 12 mesh networks in rural villages uh, in southeast India. And uh, it's a great conference. Um, there's like space to hack in Seabase, the hacker space in Berlin, also one of the oldest hacker spaces. Um, and uh, lots of different talks and workshops going on. Anyone could give a presentation or, uh, you know, there's also an unconference track. So ad hoc creating. Uh, Groups we created one for for the Network Commons license, for instance. And we're able to like gather folks from ten different countries at the same table and talk about peering agreements and how we can work together. Um, Battle Mesh uh, happened in Denmark this year, and this is more of a, a sort of routing protocol showdown, um, in which different routing protocols are are tested live in the wild. Um, and I believe the one that won this year was BMX Six which is sort of the next iteration of Batman. Um, and last slide is how to help. We have Thursday evening hack nights, as I said, so um, if you want to come by, check out uh, the Oakland Hackerspace Pseudo Room, or right off the 19th Street BART uh, in Oakland. And uh, hack nights are pretty open and flexible, so you can come in and we'll find something for you to work on. Um, or you can teach us something that you know. Uh, lots of different ways to plug in. Do you want to describe some of the different ways? Sure, yeah. You, also, you know, if you're if you're looking to start a mesh network here, you know, anybody's interested, you can also start, there's a meetup in Berkeley, for instance, it's now uh, trying to get together uh, infrequently to make sure that folks who are interested in mesh networking out there have a, have a place to come and talk and, and start to prepare, start to work with the hardware and the software. So the same thing, if we can grow that at all. Um, there's, there's across the board of things that we're interested in are, are available sort of research and, uh, and ta projects and, and tasks, um, looking into everything from how do we get more community involvement, how do we work with different communities, uh, especially geospatially located communities, um, and uh, as well as uh, doing research on uh, logistics and, and legal and policies and things like this. 
uh, raising funds, uh, alternative funding models, different uh, businesses and different business uh, uh, sort of plans for developing services and uh, for products that might interoperate with running a mesh network and an open network, uh, things like this. Um, and user research. So one of one of the things we're really excited about is designing local local applications for the mesh. A uh, project I worked on briefly with the Open Technology Institute called Tidepools is a, a mapping application uh, for designed for um, mobile users, mobile scenarios, and uh, decentralized networks um, using Leaflet.js and OpenStreetMaps and uh, a set of reskinnable icons and that sort of thing. People can create their own hyper-local maps. And this was uh, used after Hurricane Sandy. They quickly developed a, a SMS uh, functionality um, to, the, to the program so that uh, people were able to text needs and uh, requests for help, that sort of thing, uh, to the local community center that was providing internet for the neighborhood. Um, yeah, and all this is documented in our wiki. Uh, we have, uh, we're really good at documenting, especially Jenny spends a lot of time documenting, so we can share this stuff and get feedback. So please check out our wiki. Sudamesh.org will just be directly to our wiki. Uh, so you can check that out, um, including all the different ap application ideas for local area uh, applications. Well, I think that about sums it up. Cool. We can do questions, or I'm not sure what you're Yeah, sure. Do <coughs> anybody have any questions? How, I, don't, I, I know I've heard of a mesh network, and I kind of know what it is. How secure is like a mesh network? Like how, if, if I was on a mesh network, how secure should I feel? So it's always, you should always be asking that question, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> all right, that's sort of the, you have to analyze it on a case-by-case -case basis. And the only way to do, use the internet securely is to invest in what are ultimately Security not the secure. Exactly. Not the, always the most secure processes, but that will be some level of security. So it's never a perfect game. In terms of mesh networking, there have been some issues recently that people have been investigating around surveillance. There's always questions, for instance, about people using your network and the traffic on it, and also just you, you generally using uh, the network for things that are private or need to generally be secure, et cetera, et cetera. So one thing we're doing, for instance, is uh, your individual node will, have, will be broadcasting multiple networks. So one network will be a private home network that will use WP encryption, so you can actually have like, a key and that will encrypt your traffic on it, so it can't be snooped very easily. But then secondly, you'll have another broadcast network that will be open, there's, there's no encryption, so it's just, it's just sort of flying out there. Um, but if you definitely want to be secure, encrypt your traffic, you know, use PGP, et cetera, et cetera. We also, uh, at Sudaroom, we host monthly crypto parties where we teach people how to use digital security tools. So we set people up with uh, PGP keys for email, um, uh, mobile applications such as TextSecure for encrypted text messages, Redphone for encrypted phone calls, um, uh, using off-the-record chatting, um, Pigeon's a good application for that. Uh, uh, every third Sunday at Cedar Room, we host uh, workshops where we just teach people how to use these tools um, and focusing on different kinds of communities. So, uh, Is this Sunday? Yeah, this Sunday, actually. If, you, if you'd like to check out Cedar Room, if you're interested in digital security um, or you are savvy with digital security and would be interested in teaching people how to use these tools, uh, we welcome you to come by. So, two to five. Um, but ultimately, I think that sort of end-to-end -end en encryption, end-to-end uh, -end security, user-end security, where uh, any individual human is practicing good security hygiene uh, is ideal. Um, and that open networks are open networks, and you have to expect that. And maybe one reveal, too, is that uh, there was an issue was in Seattle, the Seattle Mesh Network, where uh, you could actually do tracking. You can do tracking of people who are on the network by their device associating different points as they move around. So that's sort Mac of like addresses. Exactly. And that's obvious. a tricky thing with. I mean, you can change. You can. You can. What's the term for? Uh, spoof. You spoof, spoof your Mac address, address on a laptop, but it's a lot harder with a smartphone. Yeah. So it's a little convoluted about how you would. Yeah. <laughs> but one one way to get around that, for example, is to turn your device off. So you're not connecting. This is like one way, but. But also, it's, it's a challenge for a community or a network, right? Right now, some people have access to this data, and some people have access to being able to sleep on, you know, examine traffic over the internet over local networks, but not everybody. And so with the mesh network, at least, the community is in control of like, how that data is being passed out and can address and deal with situations as they come up on an ad hoc basis. So for us, what we're looking into is ways to get, get around that and also just teaching good security practices around, well, if you don't want to have yourself on the associating, make sure you turn off your internet. If it doesn't matter what you're doing, it, yeah, you're not. And also that all this is available to anyone. So anyone on the network can be doing it too, rather than just a, a small few who are doing it secretly.
Cool, thanks. So basically, you take a router, you flash it, and you, you install this software on there to enable the, the mesh network around a, a, a specific neighborhood, right? So can you install apps on it? Like, let's say you put a, a wireless camera like around a neighborhood. Could like people have access to that camera and stuff like that? Yeah. yeah. Most of these devices have serial ports, and they might have extra um, uh, Ethernet yeah. ports. So you can actually connect devices straight into it. You can also have ancillary devices connect to it wirelessly, for instance. But it's definitely a huge opportunity. Uh, for instance, there's a group, ESC.coop, the Energy Solidarity Cooperative, that a friend of mine works with in Oakland, and they're trying to get data on where the sun actually shines, because they're trying to install uh, solar panels for really cheap on everyday people's homes. Um, so if they can plug into our network, for example, and give people um, devices that just connect to their router, they can get all this data and have it streaming, so they can do analysis and figure out where to actually build their solar panels. But you can do anything, anything like that. So you would need like uh, uh, repeaters to extend the signal all the way around the neighborhood if there's just a provider. And so, the, so the, the radius on the Pico stations is about two blocks. So it's a four block total um, coverage if it's relatively unobstructed by trees or large buildings. Um, and so the, the goal is actually to blanket the East Bay in these Pico stations, the ultimate goal, because uh, that would provide the best coverage. Um, but to fill in the gaps, that's hence the backbone links, the point-to-point -point links. So you can have like clusters of, uh, of routers that are still connected to the mesh um, through these longer distance links. The, the, if, you, if you're connecting to the router, does every router that connects to it needs to be flashed, basically? Right? Yeah, or it has to be compatible somehow. Yeah. So there's, there's some running other the software. compatible devices. Yeah, mm -hmm. And like I mentioned, so for instance, if someone in Berkeley was going to, as an ISP, there's a bunch of tiny ISPs out there, if they wanted to start developing an open mesh network for whatever reason, they could start building it out, use a different protocol, use whatever, and around wherever we start to bump up the network, wherever we start building, we can just put a binding on it, run different devices and actually convert the traffic between the two and connect them. So that's sort of like the opportunity. Gateway. Yeah. yeah. I want to implement it in my neighborhood. Awesome. Yeah, we're <laughs> So I have a question. So when the person shares their bandwidth for the ISP, so do they have a software that they throttle it down or something like that? So they control it? That's exactly it. It's a little web interface that shows up in the w, open WRT admin interface. So you can just it should be a dial. I don't remember if there's gonna be a dial or not, but you turn it. Oh, okay. I think it's still getting finished up the interface. Okay. But actually I um, you can also check out our GitHub, uh, github.com slash uh, pseudomesh. And there's about fifteen repositories in there, the different uh, tools that people are working on. Yeah. And Samir mentioned Luis, who is a student formerly in this class, uh, who actually what he's doing right now is trying to build a, a, the OpenWRT firmware from scratch, and sort of knowing all the different components and flashing his own routers to get up to speed on the technical layer, which is like we'd shown with that little disaster network called satellite dish. We're doing a lot of learning and, and doing and just sort of trying things out so we can become experts in all the different components that we're putting together. And that's, that's definitely a way to participate too, is the software's all out there. You need to start installing it and to see see what the problems are. And sometimes we have folks who do that and they'll, they'll say, hey, this isn't working and we'll get a bug. You know, we'll have to find a bug we can actually start to address because of that. So it's always a value addition with more eyes. I don't know if you all know that. Linus is long? Can you talk about Linus is long? Linus is Okay. Well, yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's an interesting rule of thumb. Just the more number of eyes, the fewer unknown bugs, fewer unknown problems. So the more people looking at it, the less likely to miss something. So is there a distinction between the security within the mesh and um, outside? Like, say, I'm just thinking, like, someone would be able, someone in the mesh would be, depending on security, would be able to exploit um, any, like, if the security within the mesh was less than between the mesh and the outside. Like, say, someone who wanted to exploit the systems within the mesh, and, like, a mine Bitcoin dimension. Well, basically, like, uh, there's a lot of like different vectors, attack vectors, and you know, there's lots of vulnerabilities for running any kind of network. So the the only like sort of strategy for the situation in general is to approach it case by case and to say it's a good thing for us to establish. Like, actually, this is a very baseline sort of maneuver, right? Like, we wish we already had internet, fast internet available everywhere for everyone now, right? And we can build other networks on top of that. We can do other things on top of it. So building that from scratch, scratch is like an essential element to doing so many other things. It's really just a platform. We want to see other stuff happen. I mean, part of this is like our motivation to do other things in local communities, and this is sort of like the first step to get there. Uh, so, but, but doing that is gonna—you have to approach different kinds of security risks and vulnerabilities. And so, all you have to do is focus on 
actually articulating those and addressing them one by one. And, uh, where we're at is, like, like I said earlier, just we have a, a couple of issues that have come up, we've started addressing them, and other than that, we're patching the firmware, that's sort of like the biggest attack vectors for us. But in terms of uh, people exploiting folks on the network, it's, it's no more or less a risk than, than any sort of widely available public network. People should know that too, that's part of the reason providing a, a private sort of network in the, in the home is like a huge feature, so that you can just do what, whatever you're going to do in the home, and know that when you're connecting to a public network, it's a public network, and you're, you're doing public things that are, that are um, not necessarily as easily obscure. Now for ISPs like your AT&T's, Comcast, how do you interact with them? Like I'm feeling they wouldn't really like having this free internet. Yeah. So like how do you manage like any, do you expect any backlash from some of that if this were to become like a big thing? It's unclear. This country is weird when it comes yeah. to internet, internet policy. Uh, and so we're we're staying positive. You know, we want to work with ISPs. You want people to be able to access the internet everywhere uh, seamlessly, to be able to walk around their device we associate without getting disconnected. That's the, the vision, that's the future we want to live in. And uh, we think we'll get there, and we think there's enough players who want to build this with us. In terms of, like, if you, for example, have a Comcast connection, um, 